So let's go ahead and uh, dive in a bit more on, we talked about the different stages. There's those scarier kind of three and four stages of the progression of the disease. What happens when we start to move into those areas and uh, how are we gonna adjust to the change in altitude, so to speak? So please welcome back uh, Jane Mitchell from OHSU. She's gonna tarry us a little bit more on this road. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about disease progression. So we talked about stage C and we talked about um, at New York Heart class is usually two or three consistently. Uh, if you look at the echo of a patient, you know that the patient's gonna have some type of structural difference, right? So we, for stage C, we get back to A through the D. C is sort of most of your patients. Um, goals of therapy, patient education, symptom relief, prevent rehospitalization, prolong survival, and also address the comorbidities. Now somebody asked a really good question a few minutes ago in the break. When we talk about HEF-REF versus HEF-PEF, when do we use the ACE, the beta blocker, and the spironolactone? We use those for HEF-REF. That's what the studies show us. There are, there's no data for HEF-PEF using those drugs. However, for HEF-PEF, I'm dealing with the comorbidities, and if the patient's diabetic, am I gonna have them on an ACE? Yes. If they have AFib with RVR, am I gonna have them on a beta blocker? Yes. So sometimes you will see those drugs used on those patients, but it's not for the same reasons. All right. Um, as far as, uh, you know, we talked about for HEF-REF, we go up on the medications. <coughs> then we start thinking about BIVs or a, a defibrillator. And then we start thinking if that doesn't work, then we want to talk about VADs, and then we, we want to talk about transplants. Again, the progression of the disease, stage C, and then stage D over here. This is a patient's house, <laughs> the, the beauty of the home visit. So you know you're talking to the patient, and you're like, something's not adding up. I need to just, I'm very visual, and when I walked into this home, I was like, okay, so now I know what's going on. So the problem is, this patient, I think it was a Richmond Clinic patient, and what happened was I, I took a picture because I said to the patient, so is it okay if I just take a picture so I can just sort of um, understand like what's going on here and, and that way I, I'll, I'll know what medicine you're taking? And she was like, yeah, okay, and I was like, great. <laughs> so, so what you need to know is over here is a pile of bills and unopened mail. This lady has a child that is a special needs child and that she is the primary caregiver for. So how do you think that's going? I don't think any of it's going. To ask this lady to weigh every day, forget it. I said to her, you don't need to weigh every day. I, I already know that she's too overwhelmed to do anything, right? I just, I wanna get like most of these meds out. That's what I was thinking. What three drugs do you need to be on? Because that's all you need. So uh, I actually texted the, um, I texted the team a secure email and I titled it Mayday, Mayday. <laughs> so, so the thing is, I'm not gonna be able to throw these drugs out, but, but um, it, because she just met me, right? I just walked into her house, like who am I? So I talked to the team and I think they got a social worker, they got the physician, they got the nurses out there. This lady um, uh, passed away probably about three months after this picture. But this just lets you know the patient says, oh, and I said, let's talk about your meds. Let's talk about how you take them. And she goes, oh, I take it just like it's on this paper. And I was like, really? Okay, so walk me through it. Well, she actually started at this side of the room, and she'd start taking some of some. Some, there was Cipro. There was all kinds, like steroids. There's all kinds of stuff in there. And so it was really, um, she was just really taking, like, whatever. So this is why she wasn't doing well. Um, so, so you just have to know what your patient's taking, and um, if they say they're taking it, you, you got to wonder sometimes if things aren't adding up. Maybe, maybe we just need to go take a look. Now, for advanced heart failure, when do we actually move that patient from a C to a D? So they have to have severe heart failure symptoms. So class three to four, they have to have episodes of volume overload. Um, you're looking at the echo. It looks, it has functional changes. Um, the B-type natriuretic peptide, when am I going to use that? I'm going to use that a lot. It is a really good marker for me to look at my patient. If I have a patient, and normal is, if it's a regular BNP, which is most of Portland, 
um, does the, that test, it's, if it's higher than 100, it's abnormal, okay? What that measures is if my left ventricle is stretched out, it releases peptides. The peptides, sort of like the secubitril in the medicine that we were talking about, based on the same thing, the peptides go to my kidneys and tell my kidneys to pee. After a while, the peptides are so high, my kidneys are like, I can't hear you, but I can measure the level and it gives me an indication of how that patient's doing. So if I have a BNP, a patient with a BNP of 1,000 and it's staying up there, that patient is shifted, right? That patient is, is on the far right of the trajectory. Now, when do we use this NT Pro BNP? All it is is it's a fancier re reagent than it's used at OHSU. It's a more stable reagent. Not all the hospitals use it, but it shifts then. So really then it's instead of 100 or greater, it's 300 or greater. So if I have somebody with an NT Pro BNP of 1,000, it still means they have heart failure. Does that make sense to everybody? It's just a little bit, it's, it's more stable. The reagent that they use is more stable. So, um, so I want to look at that, and guess what? If it's, we use this in amyloid patients all the time, and guess what the numbers are? 30,000, 50,000. I mean, that's a lot of stress on that patient's uh, ventricle wall. So if I see that they can't do the, you know, my favorite six-minute walk test, <laughs> and um, uh, if, if they have poor function on that, that's also a marker. This patient's not going to do well. And then if you look at more than one hospitalization for the last six months, that's also uh, um, a problem. You will notice as patients near the end of their life, you will start having to come down on the meds. So typically for heart failure with reduced, we like to get them on certain percentage um, target doses. <coughs> Lisinopril is 20, um, uh, usually 10 twice a day. Carvedilol would be 25 twice a day. Uh, metoprolol is 200. So I have these certain ideas in my mind of what I need to get that patient to in order to optimize their function. Um, what happens as the disease progresses, I start having to back up on those medicines. And the reason I have to back up on them is because of usually blood pressure. So when, I, when you see the patient who's only on 3.125 of Carvedilol twice a day and is having issues with their heart failure, you know that I'm already, and their pressure's 90 over 60, that patient is way to the right of that curve because that patient is not gonna do well. Uh, so the therapies that will make them live longer and keep them out of the hospital, I'm having to take away because their blood pressure can't support it. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So here's the deal. This is when you're going to worry. This, the hospitalizations start stacking up. Remember, their mortality rate goes up. If I put this by v pacemaker in somebody, and all that is is it simply fixes timing. So in patients who have a low ejection fraction who have a big left bundle branch block, I know that I can optimize their timing by putting a pacing lead in the right side of their heart and a pacing lead in the left, and I can fix their timing. So, so that way, um, if, if their heart's pumping like this, like a, this is what a left bundle branch block does to your heart, if it's pumping like this, my patient's valve, their mitral valve leaks a lot and it makes them feel bad. So we know we can put a biventricular ICD, usually it comes with a defibrillator, in these patients and it fixes the timing. So their functional class goes from like a four to a three or a three to a two, but it dramatically will change the way they feel. And that's a, that special type of, of device. Now, we put ICDs in people who have low ejection fractions to prevent ventricular arrhythmias, right? Or actually to address the ventricular arrhythmias. So if a patient goes into V-fib, it's gonna shock them. Is it gonna make their heart failure better? Just a plain old defibrillator? No, but it'll shock them if they go into VTAC or, or if they go into V-fib. So it, it will save their lives, but they still have heart failure. But the BI-V, the, the way that's a little different is it's gonna optimize the timing, plus it's gonna save their life because it's got the, the um, ICD in it. So, and the thing is, some, some of your patients will say to me, Jane, I don't want to be shocked. I, honestly, I couldn't blame them. It depends on your age, right? If you're 80 and you have heart failure, it might not be so bad if you're going to die to die from sudden death, because we know what happens is you will die either from shortness of breath, kidney failure, or sudden death. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, 
you notice you start down titrating drugs. Their kidneys get so much worse that you can't really effectively diurese them and you can't have them on the right drugs. Maybe I had to take their ACE off because guess what? Their creatinine is now 2.5. So I can't have them on an ACE. I'm going to switch them to hydralazine and nitrates. They start, uh, their functional capacity is worse, their right ventricle gets worse, and the high BNP levels we talked about, recurrent ventricular arrhythmias. When somebody's end stage heart failure, they start having a lot of VTAC, and they start having a lot of EFib. So um, keep that in mind. And then um, if the patient has diastolic heart failure, remember that that's the um, heart failure with preserved, and they have it from hypertension, and then all of a sudden they're not hypertensive anymore. That means you better watch out because bad things are going to start happening. That means that heart has started to get big and the patient's going on the other side of it. So <coughs> does that make sense? And we'll see that with our case study. So stage D, New York Heart Class 3B or 4 for greater than 45 out of 60 days. Recurrent hospitalizations, they start not responding. Um, their mortality rates like 30 to 50% for one year. And then your goals of therapy, again, symptom relief, prevent rehospitalization, prevent um, um, mor mortality, and improve quality of life. This is where those talks are really important. So Mrs. J, 49-year-old, she comes to the office for follow-up again. History of VT arrest. She's had, um, in this, <laughs> this patient, I think she had nine or ten, nine or ten hospitalizations, she'd love to come into the ER in full cardiac arrest. And it, either her potassium was two or it was seven. So one time she decided she liked to take the potassium because it was her, her heart pill, it made her heart stronger. So she took so many of them that it, she came in totally dead with a, with a uh, potassium of seven. Of course, she was resuscitated and she did fine because she's just like a very um, incredible person. So anyway, so VT arrest, she did have an ICD. She was stage D by this point and a New York Heart Class 3B. Now 3B is when, I can't really say, that I know they're more than a three, but they're not quite a four. So that's when we call 3B, just to make it confusing. And she had significant right-sided failure. And because of that, then diuretic dosing was very challenging. We had to have her on torsamide. She had pulmonary hypertension. Um, and uh, the thing about pulmonary hypertension, if somebody needs BiPAP because maybe they have sleep apnea and you don't treat it, what happens to their right ventricle? It gets a lot sicker. So that ventricle is pumping up against your lungs with every beat while you're sleeping at night. Those pressures are going higher, so that right ventricle gets huge. And when your right ventricle starts failing, um, really not a lot of good things happen for you. You dump fluid in your belly, you don't, um, you don't absorb your medicines like you should, you feel awful, you don't like to do anything. Um, so that these were also some issues. This is her chest x-ray. Yeah, <laughs> I, like, I like the way your eyes got bigger. Oh, her heart's a little large. Okay, <laughs> so and then here I can see this patient has an ICD because that's the lead. And remember, all that's going to do, it's not going to make her heart failure better. It's not a bi V. There's not two leads, one on either side. Um, it's only going to shock her. So if she has VT, it's going to shock her. And she's also got fluid. This is her echo. Uh, EF is it really, I, I'll go straight to the report first to see what the big things are. LV cavity severely increased. The systolic function is decreased. EF is 20%, severely enlarged right ventricle. Okay, so when I read that, I go, uh-oh. Okay, then I know there's some badness happening. Moderately reduced RV systolic function, so the right ventricle is starting to not pump efficiently, so she's getting really biventricular heart failure. Um, severe tricuspid regurge. And um, uh, so that never makes people feel better. When people have tricuspid regurge, they feel awful. They're short of breath. They're symptomatic. It's just really hard to make them feel good. Um, and then also uh, no significant changes. So look at that. In how many years, a couple years, she hasn't changed her, which is like remarkable. You just don't see this usually. Uh, you guys, usually this patient would be dead in a year, but this 
this particular patient was made of something, I don't know what it was, but she was, she was very, um, she persevered. If I go to the LVID little d, that's the diameter of the left ventricle. And if I look at that diameter and it's greater than 5.7, I know that that patient's starting to get a big heart. If you see a seven, that patient really should be followed by the advanced heart failure team because that patient's in trouble. Um, if you see an eight, I mean, we've, we've actually had 10s and 11s um, before the patient got their transplant. This is her lab. Sodium, down. Potassium, again, I, every time I ordered lab on this patient, I would just almost like, I'd look through one finger to see what, it's like, what is it today? Because you never know. Um, her creatinine, as you can see, is going up. Remember the, our criteria for um, uh, renal involvement, right? And she's got the, the, the creatinine that's going all over the place. And the BUN, BUN is probably a very good marker of poor prognosis. If a patient is 43 or higher, we know from the ADHERE study um, uh, data that that patient has a higher mortality. And look, hers is only, it's only 36, so that was actually pretty good. So. Um, Magnesium, we check on these folks. This patient, as I recall, her, was on um, torsamide, and then we had to do metolazone many times. And let me tell you, metolazone with your potassium, nothing will make you work harder. I hate the drug. I only use it when I have to. But sometimes your potassium will go from 4.5 to 2 in one day. So you have to be all over those patients' potassiums. And then, of course, she was anemic, right, because she had renal insufficiency. And check that NT Pro BNP. So at some point you can say, okay, you know what? We don't need to mo monitor this anymore because it's bad. I already know it's bad, and it's not really going to help me by knowing if it's ten or three thousand. <laughs> so where do you think she is on the curve? You think she's near four? Mm, yeah. I'm game. So are we going to have Kelly next? We are. Okay. Kelly's part. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jay.